in this chapter 13, part B, on the peripheral nervous system. So in the last section, we talked about the anatomical structure of the eyeball um, and how it was suited for our sense of vision. Um, so it receives light stimuli. So what is light? So light is basically electromagnetic radiation. So it's energy um, that travels in the form of waves. So the electromagnetic spectrum um, includes gamma rays, x-rays, UV, all the, all the way to radio waves. So the visible light spectrum only is a small sliver of the entire electromagnetic range. Um, so different colors are characterized by their different wavelengths or how fast their color waves are traveling. Um, but generally, the visible light spectrum, um, the waves are going to travel between 400 and 700 nanometers. So again, our eyes are only able to respond to this visible light spectrum, but there are some other organisms that can detect um, UV or infrared. Um, so like bees um, are able to see uh, infrared. So flowers show different colors to them than what we would see with our eyes. Like we said, light was just basically energy that's traveling in a wave-like fashion. So sometimes uh, these packets of light energy are referred as photons. Um, and they're traveling at extremely high speed. So the speed of light is roughly 186,000 miles per second. So when visible light travels through a spectrum, say like a prism, um, it can be broken up into its different bands or colors. So this is when we have that rainbow. So red wavelengths are the longest. So they're on this end of the spectrum. Um, so they also have the lowest energy. Violet waves, however, are the shortest and they have the most energy. So when you see a color and you perceive it, um, what you're seeing and perceiving is just the reflection of that wavelength. Um, so the reason grass is green is because it absorbs all of the other wavelengths coming in, all of the other energy waves, except for green. So green is going to be reflected back, and that's what our eyes are able to detect. Um, same thing with why the sky is blue. Right? So it absorbs all of the wavelengths except blue. It reflects blue that we can detect with our eyes. Um, so white light or white surfaces can absorb or reflect all the colors. Um, so they don't absorb any of those energies as opposed to black surfaces, which can absorb all color. So this is why um, if you wear a white shirt in the summertime, it's not as hot. You don't get as sweaty um, if you wear a black shirt. So refraction is just the bending of these incoming light rays. Um, so when light travels through different transparent mediums, it can shift its angle. Right? So we have um, the path of light is at an now oblique angle. So a common example would be from the transition of liquid to air. Right? So when you look at a pencil in a glass of water, right, light refraction causes this kind of disconnect between the two halves. So the lenses of our eye can also work to refract light in the same manner. So both sides are curved. Right? So convex means that they're thicker in the center than at the edges. Concave means that they're thicker at the edges than in the center. So the lenses of the eye can also work to refract light because they're curved on both sides. So when light passes through the cornea, it's going to refract. And then when it passes through the lens, um, it'll be refracted again. So our convex lenses help bend light at a focal point. Right? So we want these light rays to bend in a manner that they're going to meet up or converge on a single focal point um, in the retina. So the image that's formed at the focal point is actually going to be upside down and reversed right? uh, from left to right. So processing in the brain Right. During our perception, um, flips our images, our received images, right side up so that we don't actually see or perceive everything upside down. 
Um, but it's similar when we look at the letter E slide in lab you know, under the microscope. So when you look at the slide with the naked eye, it's just a normal upright E. Right? Uh, but under the microscope, it's been flipped and reversed. Um, and something interesting is, is theorized that newborn babies actually see everything upside down in their first few days of life. So like I said, it, the images that our brain receives are actually flipped and upside down, but our brain processing can correct that so that we actually see things right side up. Um, but it takes a little while for babies' brains to develop this skill. So as light enters the eye, it's going to pass through the cornea. Um, then the aqueous humor in that anterior segment passes through the lens where it gets refracted again, and then through the vitreous humor fluid in the posterior segment. So then finally it reaches the neural layer of the retina, uh, which contains those photoreceptors. So along this pathway, light's going to be bent or refracted three times. So once when it enters the cornea, right, so we have this curved cornea that's going to refract and bend the light rays. Uh, second, when it enters the lens, right, so we have a curve here. And then third, when it leaves the lens and it passes and crosses this third curved surface. The majority of our refractory power is in the cornea, um, but it's constant and can't change. Remember, we can change the shape of the lens um, to adjust for different types of vision. So in the case of distant vision, we can flatten the lens a bit. So the ciliary muscle will tighten and pull on those suspensory ligaments to kind of flatten out the lens. So we get uh, some more convergence on that focal point. So from a distant object, the light rays have enough distance and time to kind of come in at a parallel formation. Whereas in close vision, right, we have uh, light rays coming in from different angles. Right? So in this case, for closer vision, the lens would bulge more. So the muscles would relax and let the, uh, the lens kind of relax. So some problems associated with this light refraction can be related to the shape of the eyeball or different structures of the eyeball. So in myopia or nearsightedness, um, in this case, the eyeball is too long. So that focal point can't quite reach far enough to reach the retina. So this would typically be corrected with one of these concave lenses. So it helps push that focal point a little further back so it can make contact with those photoreceptors. Hyperopia or farsightedness is when the eyeball is a little too short. So the focal point is going to go beyond the retina. So we can't get a sharp, clear, focused image. So this would typically be corrected with a convex lens. So it's going to shorten that focal point. In an astigmatism, we have some unequal curvatures in just some different parts of the cornea or the lens itself. These would be corrected with cylindrically ground lenses, uh, more specialized, or even laser procedures. So we said there were two types of photoreceptors in the retina. Uh, the rods are going to be very sensitive to light, so they're more adept for dark night vision or peripheral vision. So the rods only contain one pigment, so they're only going to receive their um, light signals in gray tones. Um, also, you can see that many uh, different rods converge on single output cells, single output ganglion cells. So we have uh, kind of multiple inputs converging on one output. So there's kind of a lot of background noise sometimes. So the cones have a lower sensitivity, so they respond to bright light. Um, so they have three pigments. So this allows us to have that high definition, vivid colored sight. Um, and also compared to the rods, they don't have these converging pathways. So the uh, cones kind of have their own single pathways, so we get direct, accurate, high-resolution images from these cone cells. Color blindness is when an individual lacks one or more of those color cone pigments. Um, so it's inherited as an X-linked condition, so meaning it travels on the X chromosome. 
Um, so because of this, it's more commonly seen in males, um, but it's estimated uh, up to 10% of males in the population have some form of color blindness. The most common type is red-green, um, in which either the red cones or the green cones are present. Um, so depending which one's missing, the red can look like green or vice versa. So this figure is showing the Ishihara test for color blindness. So people with regular vision would be able to easily see the numbers on these circles. Right? If you have red-green color blindness, though, um, you're not able to detect some of these lighter shades of reds, um, and they get kind of mixed in and lost in with the green pigment. So as the axons of the retina leave the eye, they're gonna form the optic nerve. Um, so as the optic nerve travels to the brain, it's going to cross over at the optic chiasma, so this little X-shaped structure, um, and then continues along the optic tracts. Each optic tract is gonna contain fibers from the lateral aspect of the eye on the same side and the medial aspect of the opposite side. So basically it just means that each cerebral hemisphere is going to receive input from both eyes. So from there, most of these fibers of the optic tracts are going to continue on to the lateral geniculate nucleus within the thalamus. So remember we said the thalamus was kind of like the incoming processing center. Um, so then from there, the thalamus neurons are going to reroute our impulses to that primary visual cortex all the way in the occipital lobes. So here is where um, we'll start to have that conscious perception of the visual images we're receiving. Right? So we'll start to determine where um, you know, our object is. So it's location, if it's moving, the spatial processing part. Um, and then the ventral stream is going to look at kind of the what it is. So shape, size, color, depth perception uh, requires input from both eyes. Um, so, you know, both eyes view the same image just from slightly different angles. So if you look at an object with both eyes and close one and the other, it looks like the object is kind of hopping back and forth right? so due to this slightly different angle that your eyes are receiving those light rays. So the visual cortex is going to just fuse these two incoming slightly different images together to give us that three-dimensional um, image that gives us our depth perception. So looking at the chemical senses of smell and taste, so these are complementary senses, meaning they're usually lumped in together because they work kind of hand in hand uh, and they're very similar. Um, so they work together to basically let us know whether a substance should be savored or avoided. Right? So if something smells bad or rotten, right, you know not to eat it. You're gonna probably taste really bad too. So they're both considered to be chemoreceptors. This meaning that chemicals have to be dissolved in an aqueous solution. Um, in order to be detected by these chemoreceptors. So the aqueous solution in smell would be the mucus in your sinus cavity, um, and in taste would be your saliva in your mouth. So the olfactory epithelium is the organ of smell located in the uh, roof of the nasal cavity. Um, so it's gonna contain your olfactory sensory neurons. So these are bipolar neurons. Right? So call back to um, when we talked about types of neuron. Uh, the bipolars basically are from point A to point B. Okay. Um, and they have these kind of radiating, branching olfactory cilia just to increase their surface area to pick up these stimuli. So particular smells can contain hundreds of different odorants or particles. Um, so we have about 400 unique smell receptors in our nose, and each one is going to bind to a different type of, uh, each odor is going to bind to a different receptor. So pain and temperature receptors are also in the nasal cavity. So we're able to detect irritants like ammonia, um, or we can actually kind of detect hot and cold smells. So you can smell if something's spicy or um, has maybe menthol or a minty aspect to it. Uh, so this figure is just showing we have different types of olfactory smell receptors that are going to respond to specific types of odor particles. 
So taste buds are our sensory organs for taste. Um, so there's roughly 10,000 taste buds located on the tongue in what are called papillae, which are kind of like these little bumps uh, or projections on the surface of the tongue. So the fungiform papillae um, are going to be the most widespread um, scattered all across the tongue. Uh, the foliate papillae are on kind of the lateral aspects on the back of the tongue. Um, and the valate are this kind of upside down V-shaped row of taste buds in the back. And then there's also a few um, in the soft palate, the cheeks and the pharynx right down in the throat region. So each taste bud consists of 50 to 100 of these flask shaped epithelial cells. You kind of see here, taste buds. Um, so the gustatory epithelial cells are our taste receptor cells. So they have um, some microvilli called gustatory uh, hairs that project out um, into the taste pores or the openings. So when you taste something, it kind of dissolves in the saliva and it makes contact and comes into these uh, taste pores where it makes contact with our gustatory hairs. And then near the base um, of the taste bud, we have our sensory neurons, right? Uh, so they're connected to these epithelial cells. So they're what going to send those taste impulses, those taste signals to the brain. Um, taste buds also contain basal epithelial cells, these little light blue cells here. Um, so these are just stem cells that are going to divide every week or so to replenish and replace your taste buds. So you think your tongue undergoes a lot of abrasion when you eat, and if you burn your tongue, um, you can't taste well for a couple of days. But then your taste buds grow back um, and regenerate from those basal epithelial cells. There are five basic taste sensations. Sweet tasting foods contain lots of sugars. Sour tasting foods have high acid content. So remember when we talked about the pH scale, something that is an acid has lots of hydrogen ions. Uh, salty tasting foods have the metal ions, so lots of those uh, inorganic salts like sodium chloride. Uh, bitter tasting foods, kind of the opposite of sour tasting foods. So whereas sour, we said was acidic, bitter would be very alkaline. So alkaloids, um, things like quinine, nicotine, caffeine. Um, so think just really black coffee, how it's real bitter. Um, walnut skin. Um, the fifth taste sensation is umami. So this is kind of the savory um, taste sensation. So <clears throat> this is how we detect amino acids, um, kind of those meaty flavors. So there's growing evidence for a possible sixth taste. Um, so we think that we might have some receptors to detect these long chain fatty acids from fatty foods. So this could perhaps explain why we like to eat fatty foods. So our taste likes and dislikes have a homeostatic value, meaning that they help guide the intake of beneficial uh, or potentially harmful substances. So if something is going to taste really bad, then it's probably not good for you to eat. So generally our dislike for sourness or bitterness is a protective way to warn us if something would be spoiled or poisonous. So in order to taste a chemical, it has to be number one, dissolved in saliva. Um, and then once it dissolves in the saliva, it has to diffuse down into the taste pore and it has to make contact with the gustatory hairs. Right? So they can send those signals through these taste neurons. So looking at the gustatory pathway from the tongue to the brain, uh, there's two main cranial nerves that are going to transmit these taste impulses from the tongue. Um, so the first one is the facial nerve. Um, so it's going to carry impulses from the anterior two thirds, so the majority of the tongue region, and the glossopharyngeal um, is going to carry impulses from that posterior third. So these nerve fibers will then synapse or connect in the solitary nucleus of the medulla. Um, so remember we said the medulla was part of the brain stem, that kind of lizard brain, primitive brain, just concerned with keeping you alive. So it's going to process, um, begin processing this incoming taste sensation information and then pass it along to the thalamus. 
Let's remember we said the thalamus was kind of the sorting center of the brain. So as these impulses arrive, the thalamus reroutes and directs the impulses to their appropriate areas of the brain. So in the case of taste, it's going to reroute those impulses to the gustatory cortex within the insular lobe. So the hypothalamus and the limbic system or that emotional system of the brain are also involved in taste. So it helps us to just have an appreciation for that taste or kind of an emotional um, connection to those flavors. So some important roles of taste involve triggering reflexes involved in digestion. So when your tongue tastes something, your brain detects that you're tasting food that's in your mouth. It's going to stimulate secretion of saliva from the salivary glands. It's also going to stimulate secretion of gastric juice by the stomach. So the stomach will start to kind of prepare um, in anticipation of this food you're about to eat. So taste can also have protective reactions, like we said, that homeostatic um, value. So if something is poisonous or you know, spoiled, we would kind of have this reflexive gagging and vomiting response. So like we said, taste and smell are considered complementary, so they kind of go hand in hand. So taste is really about 80% smell. So you all know this if you've ever had a cold and a stuffy nose. So if the nose is blocked, foods don't really have that strong of a taste. So when people eat and drink food and beverages, um, they're going to release vapors that you'll smell first before you actually taste the food. So that kind of gives your brain an anticipation of what it's going to taste like. Um, the vapors can also be released into the mouth, so you can start to kind of taste it in the air before you actually eat the food. So the mouth also contains thermoreceptors, um, so those temperature receptors, and mechanoreceptors, as well as pain receptors, those nociceptors. So we know temperature and texture can either enhance or detract from a taste, so like cold pizza versus hot pizza. Um, so some people don't like cold pizza. Some people prefer cold pizza, so it's all about that temperature affecting the taste. So another example would be like french fries. So french fries pretty much are only good when they're hot and fresh. Once they get cold, um, you know, the temperature isn't right and they don't taste as good anymore. Um, texture is another one. Um, so the texture of a food can give it different flavors. Um, so you know, like me personally, I hate water chestnuts. I don't think they have any flavor and it's just a texture thing though. Um, the texture of them just just doesn't sit well with me. So they would detract from the taste of my food. Spicy hot foods can also trigger some of those pain receptors, um, but some people experience pleasure with these. So some people that like really, really spicy food until like your nose is running and your eyes are watering, um, and start triggering these nociceptors. Okay, so looking at the structure of the ear, so the outer ear has three major areas. So we have the external outer ear, um, which is just for hearing. Uh, the middle ear of the tympanic cavity, <clears throat> also just for hearing. And the internal inner ear. So this is going to involve hearing and balance as well. So we have receptors for both hearing and balance in this inner ear, but they're going to respond to separate types of stimuli. So they're going to function independently, even though they're in the same area. So the external outer ear consists of two main parts. So we have the auricle, sometimes referred to as the pinna. So it's just a kind of oddly shaped, shell-shaped structure um, on the outside of the ear, um, but it actually serves a purpose. So this weird shape of the outer ear helps to funnel the sound waves into the ear canal. So some parts of the auricle or the outer ear include the helix, which is that uh, cartilage rim of the ear, and the earlobe. The external acoustic meatus is the auditory canal, so it's where the sound waves are going to funnel into to make contact with um, the eardrum. So when we looked at the bones and the temporal bone, one of the surface markings, the structure features you had to know was the external acoustic meatus. Um, so this is the ear canal where it's going to enter um, into the skull from the outer ear. So looking at the middle ear with the tympanic membrane, um, so this is the boundary between our external ear and the internal ear, so kind of our wall between the outside and the inside. Um, so it's just a very thin, taut uh, layer of connective tissue membrane that's going to vibrate when sound waves 
make contact with it. Um, so it's going to transfer the energy from those sound waves to these tiny little bones in the inside of the ear, which would then trigger the auditory nerves. So looking closer at the middle ear, the tympanic cavity. Um, so it's mainly air-filled cavity and mucosa lined. So the pharyngeotympanic or auditory tube is what connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. So when um, you get sick and your ears are draining, they're kind of draining into the back of your nose and throat. So normally this uh, auditory tube is flattened, um, but it can be open. So sometimes if your ears pop um, when you yawn or swallow, um, it's just the pressure within that tube. So the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, can't vibrate most efficiently if the pressure is unequal on both sides. So this would be where maybe one ear uh, pops and the sound is a little more muffled on that side than the other ear for a few minutes. The auditory ossicles are the three small bones within the tympanic cavity, uh, and they're named for their shape. So the malleus, think like a mallet, is the hammer. Um, the incus is the anvil, and the stapes is the stirrup, so like the stirrup on a horse saddle. So these are actually composed of synovial joints, so they're those kind of freely moving um, joint cavity joints. So these allow the bones to move and vibrate and transmit that vibratory motion and energy from the eardrum to the sensory nerves. So looking at the internal ear, sometimes it's referred to as the labyrinth, which means the maze, just because we have all these kind of twisty, turny channels. So the bony labyrinth is just the bone outline portion of the channels and the cavities throughout the temporal bone. Um, so we can divide the labyrinth into three regions. So the first being the vestibule. So the vestibule is kind of just the central kind of egg-shaped region, the semicircular canals here on this side, and then the cochlea on the other side. So these cavities, these channels and canals, are filled with a perilymph fluid. So it's similar to cerebrospinal fluid, so it's going to help to deliver, um, circulate nutrients, and remove waste from the cells in these structures. So the vestibule, we said, was the central kind of egg-shaped portion of the inner ear. Um, so it contains two membranous sacs. Right? So this uh, blue here is kind of the membrane portion. Oh, this is membrane lining. Right? So for the uh, cochlear duct, right, where the cochlea is the hearing portion of the inner ear, um, contains the saccule. Um, the utricle is going to be continuous with the semicircular canal, so this would be our sense of balance and equilibrium. Both of the sacs are going to contain maculate. Um, so it contains two membranous sacs. So the saccule um, is continuous with the cochlear duct, so this is the hearing portion of the inner ear. The utricle is continuous with the semicircular canals, so this is our uh, sense of balance side of the ear. So the utricle and the saccule contain equilibrium receptors called maculae that are going to respond to gravity and changes in position of the head. So the semicircular canals are three canals oriented in three different planes of space within the head. So we have an anterior, a lateral, and a posterior. So we said that the semicircular ducts were going to communicate and be connected to the utricle of the vestibule. Um, the ampulla are these kind of widened, enlarged ends of the semicircular canals that also house some of these purple equilibrium receptors. Right? So these are called the crista ampullaris. So these receptors are going to respond to more angular or rotational movements of the head. The cochlea is the small spiral uh, bony chamber in the inner ear. It's about the size of a pea. Um, so it's going to extend from the vestibule um, coming off of the saccule um, and contain our cochlear duct 
right here. I'm shown in the blue and the spiral organ, so shown in purple. So in this figure, remember the actual sensory receptors are highlighted in purple. So our spiral organ is our sensory receptor, um, or sometimes referred to as the organ of Corti, um, wrapping around this cochlea duct. So if we look at a cross section of the cochlea, we'll see it's divided into three chambers. Um, so the scala vestibule and the scala tympani are filled with perilymph. Um, the scala media, the middle duct, is going to contain endolymph. So this is what's going to flow um, within the chamber to excite or stimulate these hair cells right, on the sensory receptors. You can see it's connected to that sensory uh, neuron. So summary of the inner ear. So we said there were three primary regions, the semicircular canals. Right? So they're going to uh, have the crista ampullaris as their receptor region. Right? So they purple receptor regions, crista ampullaris. So the vestibule in the center of the inner ear um, is going to contain the maculae for its uh, sensory receptors. Um, and it's going to contain the utricle and the saccule. Right, so both of these are going to function for our sense of balance and equilibrium. Right, so the semicircular canals are more for our rotational type movements, um, whereas the maculae and the vestibule are more for linear acceleration. So are you, are you moving forwards or backwards? Are you moving up or down? And then the cochlea is going to function in our hearing reception. So its uh, receptor region is the spiral organ that wraps around the cochlear duct. So looking at sound detection. So when you hear a sound, um, you're basically hearing the sound waves. Right? So hearing is the reception of an air sound wave that's converted to a fluid wave. So it's converted to fluid in your inner ear. So then that's going to stimulate the hair cells inside of your cochlea and send those impulses to the brain. So remember we said that um, this cochlear duct is filled with fluid. So when the eardrum receives sound and vibrates, it transmits those vibration, that energy from the vibration through the fluid. So when the fluid starts to get waves from those sound waves in it, it triggers these hairs. So a little background on what is sound. So sound is any type of pressure disturbance. So we have alternating areas of high and low pressure. Um, so it's produced by a vibrating object and then propagated by molecules of the medium. So fancy way of saying air. So it travels through the air. To think of um, this is an example of a tuning fork, but you could look at a guitar string. Right? So anything that vibrates is going to produce sound. Right? So this is showing when we hit a tuning fork, it vibrates, and the areas of high pressure are going to radiate outward. Sound can be described by two physical properties, so the frequency and the amplitude. So when we look at frequency, we're looking at the number of waves that pass a given point in a given time. Um, so we look at their wavelength, right, or the distance between two consecutive crests. So a shorter wavelength, like our red wave, would have a higher frequency. So we have um, this red wave is just more frequent over the same time span. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six red waves and only three blue waves. Your low frequency waves, shown in blue, right, have a longer wavelength, so they're going to travel slower and have um, a lower pitch. So frequency is perceived as pitch, so is it a high pitch kind of squeaky voice or a really deep low pitch rumbling kind of voice? So the frequency range for our human hearing is between 20 to 20,000 hertz, right, or waves per second. Um, but most sensitive sweet spot is between 1,500 and 4,000. So again, pitch is just perception of these different frequencies. So the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. 
Um, so this is just interesting to look at how we compare our auditory fields to other species. So we know that animals, most animals, have much better hearing than we do. So our auditory field, between 20 to 20,000, cats and dogs um, can hear much further than we can, right, all the way up to maybe ultrasounds. Okay. So bats and dolphins, they can hear up to 160,000 hertz frequency. Um, so you know that bats and dolphins can also communicate via echolocation. So they're able to hear these ultrasound waves. So another way we can physically characterize properties of sound is amplitude or the height of the crest, height of the waves. Um, so amplitude is perceived as a loudness um, and it's measured in decibels, normal range between uh, 0 to 120. Um, so just a normal conversational tone would be just about 50 decibels. So we do have kind of a pain threshold with loudness. So the threshold of pain is around 120 decibels. So anything um, above 90 to 100 um, is going to start to physically damage the structures of the inner ear that detect those sounds. So looking at transmission of sound to the internal ear. So first the sound wave comes from outside the body is funneled into the auditory canal. So these sound waves make contact with the tympanic mem membrane or um, the eardrum. So this vibration is going to cause our auditory ossicles or the inner ear bones to vibrate. So this is going to amplify the pressure against this oval window or this opening to uh, the cochlear ducts. So as these bones are vibrating, they're pushing against this window next to the fluid in effect transmitting that vibration energy now into the fluid. So this is going to start to cause waves within this inner ear fluid right, as it moves through the scale of vestibuli. So any sound waves that are below our normal hearing range um, are not going to be detected. So this would be where they would be detected. So if they're not strong enough, they're just going to kind of float on by to the end of uh, the cochlea and then back around. And it'll come out the ear. So sounds that are in our hearing range would go through the cochlear duct um, and then make contact with those inner ear hair cells at this location. So zooming in on those inner ear hair cells. So when the fluid receives those pressure waves from the sound waves of the eardrum and the auditory ossicles, this fluid is going to move and bend these hairs. So when these hairs are triggered, they're going to send those impulses to the cochlear nerve. So looking at the auditory pathway to the brain, so the neural impulses from these cochlear cells, these hair cells on the inner ear, are going to travel through uh, the spiral ganglia, um, the cochlear nerve, and then from there to the cochlear nuclei of the medulla. So then from there, it'll be uh, processed through the thalamus, where it'll be rerouted to the primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. So as you can see, some of these fibers cross over. Um, along the way, but not all of them. Um, so this is just to ensure that both hemispheres are going to receive input from both ears. Okay, so this helps us to kind of localize things based on hearing. We can tell which side a sound is coming from. Equilibrium is response to various movements of the head. That's going to rely on input from our inner ear, um, so our vestibular balance receptors, as well as our visual receptors in the eye and stretch receptors in the muscle. So looking at the vestibular apparatus, we'll just look at the equilibrium receptors in the semicircular canals and the vestibule, so these purple structures. So our vestibular receptors, so the maculae in the utricle and the saccule, are going to monitor your static equilibrium whereas the semicircular canal receptors monitor dynamic equilibrium. So we said the vestibule is going to monitor static equilibrium. 
So we have one in the utricle and one in the saccule. So they basically work to monitor the position of your head in space. You make sure that you're right side up and your head is where it should be. Um, so they play a key role in maintaining posture. Um, so they respond to linear acceleration forces, but not rotational. So basically up, down, left, right, forwards and backwards. So looking at the structure of the maculae, um, so the utricle maculae have vertical hairs. So their hair cells stand upright vertically. So they're going to respond to change in movement along a horizontal plane. So if the fluid is moving horizontally, if you're moving horizontally, these hairs will then be bent. The saccule um, is going to have horizontal hair. So it would be kind of like this one, but turned on its side. So this is going to respond to vertical movement. So if you're moving up and down. Yeah, so this is showing an example of how these hair cells respond to gravity. So when your head is upright, the hairs are upright, right, as normal. So you have your steady, steady stream of these action potentials. When you tilt the head forward, these hairs bend as well. So that's going to tell the brain that the head is moving forward. Also, when you move the head back, the hairs, the fluid is going to flow, causing the hairs to tilt back as well. The crista and pilaris are the receptors in the semicircular canals. Right? So remember we said the ampulla were just kind of these widened regions at the end of the canals and they house these crista and pilaris. So these are going to monitor dynamic equilibrium, so rotational movements like twirling and spinning. Semicircular canals are located in all three planes of space, so we can detect rotational movement in all planes. So you see it's similar structure to the maculae, but instead of having either vertical or horizontal hairs, we have kind of just this, this little tuft of hairs. Um, but because it responds to angular rotational movements, right, when the fluid spins, right, these hairs would still get bent and excited. Right? So at rest, the cupula or the tuft of the sensory hairs stands upright. So once you start to rotate or spin, the endolymph fluid inside the ear um, is going to start to flow around right, and cause these hairs to bend. This lets the brain know which way the head is spinning. So equilibrium information goes to the reflex centers in the brain stem, um, that vestibular nuclei. So again, the brain stem being kind of like your primitive brain, um, so with basic body functions. So it allows for those fast reflexive responses to imbalances so we don't fall down in conjunction with the cerebellum. So if you've ever been walking and you accidentally slip or you start to trip on something, your body will try to correct itself before you even realize what's happened. So there are three modes of input for our balance and orientation. So we have our vestibular receptors, right? So our semicircular canals with the uh, crista and pilaris and the vestibular receptors in the maculae. We also have our visual receptors. So our sense of vision lets us know what's around us and our surroundings, you know, which directions we can go, how we should move, any obstacles in the way. And then somatic receptors and the stretch receptors of the muscles and the tendons. So our brain's always aware of our muscles position in order to help us maintain our balance. So then you see from there, these impulses, these incoming vestibular stimuli are going to be processed through the cerebellum and the brain stem. So this output response by the central nervous system can give us those fast reflex type uh, motions of the muscles in the eyes, uh, the neck, limbs, and trunk. So homeostatic imbalances of hearing include deafness. So there's two types of deafness. If it's a conduction deafness, that means that something is blocking the sound waves from reaching uh, the internal ear. So something as simple as maybe impacted earwax. 
Sensory neural deafness is when there's some type of um, damage or impairment to the actual neural structures from uh, either the cochlear hair cells or some of the auditory cortical cells in the brain. So cochlear implants have been used to convert incoming sound energy, um, sound waves, into electrical signals that can be detected by the brain. Um, so these have been pretty effective for congenital or um, age-related cochlear damage. So what they do is insert the device into the temporal bone, um, and then the sound processor is going to capture the sound waves and convert it into an electrical signal. Um, so then the electrical signal travels down um, this electrode through the cochlea until it reaches the hair cells. Um, so it sends impulses that are strong enough to stimulate those hair cells um, and produce the hearing sensation. 